Okay, so the next, but the first speaker comes from Turin, is one of the maintainer of Bubble.js, but it's the first time gives a talk not about Bubble.js. And uh, he loves maths and uh, computer science, but hates the mixture of uh, the, the mixing of uh, of both of them. Okay. The next speaker is Nicolò. Okay, so we are finally ready. Uh, well, as you can probably see today, I'm going to talk about records and tuples. Uh, it's a new proposal for JavaScript whose goal is to bring immutable data structures as uh, like native, uh, natively supported in the language. Uh, if you have any questions or comments or want to ask me anything, even not strictly related to this talk, you can reach out to me through Matrix or on Twitter. Also, if you have any feedback about the talk, you can use this uh, link or QR code to basically help me making it better. Okay, so before actually looking at, the, at what the proposal does, I want to start by explaining what is the problem that we're trying to solve. Uh, because when creating a new proposal, you never start from a solution, but you start from the, the problem that we have in the language. Uh, well, there are two main uh, patterns when it comes to managing state in programs, mutability and immutability. Uh, immutability objects mutate over time, so for example, you might have a class and you change the value of some of its attributes, while when using an immutable paradigm, you never update existing objects, but you change the state by recreating the world, like the world data structures that you have. Those are common in object-oriented and in functional programming. Uh, but modern languages embrace both. In JavaScript, you can kind of have both, but uh, we only have first-class support for mutable objects. Uh, however, there are some really good libraries that can help us uh, bringing immutability to the language. The most popular one is immutable.js. Uh, it provides parallel data structures uh, equivalent to the built-in JavaScript ones. So for example, instead of JavaScript objects, we can use immutable JS maps, or for example, we have lists, which are the equivalent of arrays. And those uh, immutable data structures provide some methods, for example, to set a new property. It's not really setting the new property on the existing map, uh, because the, the value in the original map is still the, like, in this example, it's still two. It has not been updated. Uh, what it does, it creates a new map with the updated property. Uh, Immutable.js also provides some utilities to define uh, what equality between two Immutable.js structures mean. Uh, and since we are working in a parallel world uh, with different data structures, it also provides utilities to convert them back to, to plain JavaScript objects. And it's the same for lists to arrays. Another quite popular library that we have is uh, Immer. Immer takes a completely different approach. Uh, it does not try to divide the world between mutable and immutable data structures. It uses uh, the built-in JavaScript, okay, the built-in JavaScript objects, and it provides a function to update them in an, in an immutable way uh, by putting all the mutations in a single place. Immutable.js records those mutations and applies them on the original object to create a new one, uh, again, without updating the original object. So this is good. We have two really good libraries uh, that give us immutability in JavaScript. So why do we need a proposal? Uh, well, every library has its own problems. And it's not because those libraries are badly designed. It's just because they have to work with uh, the language we have, uh, they have to somehow fit within the existing JavaScript semantics. 
the main problems that they have uh, is that uh, first uh, they cause an ecosystem bifurcation, especially mutable JS. And by this I mean that you now have two different ways of doing things. Uh, for example, uh, for classic JavaScript objects, you can use the like normal property access, you can use spread into a new object to update an existing property without changing the original object. When using immutable JS, you have to use their own functions, for example, get and set. Uh, this means that you cannot write some code that works uh, with whatever type of data structure it receives. You have to choose if you want to support immutable JS or if you want to support classic JavaScript. And this is the same for equality. Like if you are using immutable JS, you cannot use the classic JavaScript equality operator, you have to use the immutable JS one. And it's similar for map and set structures uh, because they, they internally use equality for their keys. Uh, so for example, if we have two lists containing both zero and one, they are the same list according to immutable JS, they are different objects according to JavaScript. So uh, like we have those two different parts of the, of the world that do not agree with each other. Uh, and the problem of having no like equality semantics shared across the whole language is that libraries have to choose what type of equality they want. For example, React uses JavaScript's equality semantics. Uh, and React uh, optimizes the rendering process by checking if the properties of components are the same or if they've changed. Uh, so in this specific example, if we rendered our app multiple times, uh, we would have uh, inside of my component different data, different uh, maps that are always have the same contents. So from an immutable JS perspective, they're always the same map. However, React does not know that. Uh, so React always re-renders the wall, like the wall application uh, because React uses JavaScript equality semantics. So this is where the records and tuples proposal can help us. Uh, records and tuples are immutable values similar to objects and arrays. They even use the same syntax. Uh, it's just prefixed with an hash. Uh, not for a particular reason, it's just that the hash is one of the few characters that we still have available for new JavaScript features. Uh, and they're compared using the classic JavaScript equality operator uh, by comparing their internal values rather than just checking if the, the reference is the same or the pointer, which is what happens with arrays or objects. Records and tuples are primitives and they can only contain other primitives. So if you try to put a mutable object inside of a record, it will throw. Uh, this is because primitives are already compared by their contents. Uh, for example, if you have two strings into different parts of the program and you compare them, uh, you are just checking that they have the same characters, not that they like have the same pointer. Uh, and it's easy to define what deep equality means with primitives because you can just primitives do not have like hidden state or some behavior that you might want to to do to to know about when comparing them. Uh, you just recursively check if the primitive values are the same. Primitives work well with isolation-based security mechanisms, such as membranes or shadow realms. Shadow realms is a new proposal, another one. Uh, but those mechanisms, mecha those systems, basically allow to you run untrusted code in your application uh, by completely isolating the different parts of code, and they only allow primitives to pass from one side to the other of this uh, like isolation system because primitives do not bring any capabilities, so you do not risk exposing security risks. And also, if you only load primitives inside records and tuples, our structures are deeply mutable. So not only it does not change uh, what is the, the thing stored inside of a record, but also the content of that thing cannot change. Uh, if we try to put an object inside of a record, uh, the object would always be the same, but we could change the contents of that object. So as, as I was already saying, records and tuples are compared by comparing their contents. And this happens recursively. So if you have a tuple instead of a record, uh, we are checking that like everything is the same. 
uh, tuples are ordered uh, like arrays and records are not. So for tuples, this is obvious, I'd say, uh, that a tuple containing one and two is different from a tuple containing two and one. However, it's not that obvious for records because in JavaScript, even if it's usually not observed, objects are ordered. So you can, you can see if an object has first A and then B, or if it has first B and then A. In records, this does not, this does not happen, so two records are equal if they have the same properties with the same value. Uh, the order does not matter. Inside of records and tuples, uh, n and n values are equal, and positive and negative zero are equal. Uh, this is something that usually people, do, like developers, don't think too much about, uh, but JavaScript has two zeros. Uh, it's natural to make them equals inside of records and tuples because they're already equal, like outside of records and tuples. We decided uh, to have a different behavior for not a number because not a number is normally different from itself. Uh, and you can easily check if a value you have is not a number. However, when they're inside records and tuple structures, like potentially big structures, and the NIN might be nested deeply somewhere, uh, it's way harder to check like where the NIN is in your structure. So we just made them equal. Uh, for positive zero, negative zero, you can, you can still distinguish them using object.is, uh, which is similar to how you can already distinguish positive and negative zero, uh, like not inside anything else using object.is. And lastly, they can, use, uh, they can be used as computed uh, map or set keys. So, for example, if we want to have a map with two keys, uh, for example, going to the coordinates on a board, to the name of a player, you can take those two values, put them in a tuple or in a record, and use that tuple as the key in your map. Uh, so, if you go back to our previous example, uh, this is identical to what I showed earlier, except that I'm using a record instead of an immutable JS map. Records use the built-in JavaScript equality semantics, so React will now know that uh, the record is actually always the same. And by the way, in the next talk, we, you will hear more about how React decides, I think, when to render or when not to render. So we've seen how to create records and tuples, what they are, uh, how to compare them. How do we update them? Or better, how do we create updated copies of them? Uh, well, exactly as we can do for objects and for arrays, we can use the spread operator to uh, add new properties or modify existing properties. And tuples support all the non-mutating array methods, such as filter, map, uh, reduce, sum, and all of them. By non-mutating array methods, I mean the methods that do not change the, the array they're called on. So, for example, tuples do not support push, because push uh, like modifies the array. Uh, it's not a problem that those methods are not supported because, for example, for push and unshift, which add an element at the end and at the beginning of the array, uh, when using tuples, you can just use spread to create a new tuple with a new element. Similarly, for pop and shift, uh, which remove an element from the end or from the beginning of an array, you can use slice to take uh, everything else except for the element you, do, you want to remove. There are other two mutating methods, array.fill and array.copyWithin. Uh, we tried to study how they're used in the ecosystem, and we concluded that uh, they're really important when working with uh, mutable arrays, but when arrays are used in an immutable way, those functions are not really used. So uh, it's not a problem if they are not supported on tuples. You can just use a combination of map and concat or slice. There are other three mutating methods, sort, reverse, and splice, which are widely used, uh, but they mutate the array they're called on. So how we could support them on tuples? And lastly, even if it's not a method, uh, how do we update a specific element in a tuple? Uh, because objects like array spread lets us add an element at the beginning or at the end. It does not let us modify a specific element. Uh, which is what we can do in records using uh, like, the, like the object spread. Uh, we were thinking about how to solve the problem with those four methods, and we realized that 
it's not something that we only need for tuples. Those, like an immutable versions of those methods, will also be useful for arrays. So we created a new child proposal from the records and tuples one, uh, which is called the change array by copy proposal. Uh, change array by copy, the change array by copy proposal introduces four new methods to do what those four mutable methods did, but in a mutable way. So for example, instead of array.sort, we have array.toSorted, which returns a new sorted array without modifying the original one. Similarly, we have array.toReversed instead of array.reverse, array.spliced instead of array.splice, and array.width to create a new array with a specific property updated. And so we are introducing those new four methods uh, on arrays, and obviously they would also then be supported on tuples. So that tuples and arrays have the same capabilities. Now, I'm sorry, let's go now back a bit uh, to when I mentioned that records and tuples are primitives and they can only contain other primitives. Uh, so what if we want to like store an object inside of a record or a tuple? Uh, because immutability is good, it's nice, but in JavaScript almost everything is an object, so we cannot just ignore the fact that objects exist. Uh, for example, all the DOM uh, stuff are objects, we have all the built-in classes such as the tapid arrays or maps and sets, uh, like also functions are objects. So we tried to find a solution to this. Uh, we couldn't just let objects be put in records and tuples, mostly for the quick for reasons I give earlier, uh, and for some security constraints that we are, had to follow. So we thought about this a lot, and we came up with a third proposal, uh, which is called symbols as weak map, as weak map keys. So weak map keys and weak maps and weak sets are built-in classes similar to map and set. Uh, they make it possible for browsers to garbage collect the, the contents of weak maps and weak sets in an, in an unobservable way. So, for example, if you have a weak set containing an object and this object is stored in some variable, we add the object to the weak set and in the browser's memory uh, there will be a weak set containing our object. If we then uh, set the variable where the object is stored to null, uh, and for some reason the engine decides to run the garbage collector, uh, the garbage collector is free to delete the object from the weak set. Uh, and it's free to do so because since we set the variable where the object was stored to null, we cannot detect what the garbage collector decided to do. Uh, so because garbage collectors are complex programs, uh, they are really hard to predict uh, what they would do. So this is important that does not let developers rely on the internal implementation of garbage collectors. Uh, however, if, for example, weak sets supported string uh, as keys, we added a string to the weak set, then we set the variable where our string is saved to null and we let the garbage collector run. Uh, the garbage collector might see that the string stored in this str variable is not used anymore, is not accessible anymore, so it might decide to remove it from the weak set. However, we could then recreate the same string uh, and check what the garbage collector decided to do. So for this reason, strings are not allowed as weak map or weak set keys. Uh, we can divide JavaScript values into categories using that uh, difference between objects and strings, uh, between garbage collectible values and forgeable values. I like to call them forgeable uh, because I mean that even if you lost access to the reference to that value, you can always recreate the same value. Uh, so the obvious ones are objects and functions which are garbage collectible because once you lose uh, access to an object, you cannot recreate the same object anymore. Strings, numbers, begins, boolean, null, and undefined are all forgeable values because you can always recreate the same value. We then have symbols, and they are divided across those two categories. We have unique symbols, which are the ones returned by the symbol factory or constructor, 
uh, they are unique, uh, and this means that if you call the sim, if you call the symbol function two times, even if with the same description, you will get two different symbols. And once you lose access to a symbol, you cannot recreate it. On the other hand, we have registered symbols, which are the ones returned by the symbol dot for function. Uh, and if you pass the same description to symbol dot for, you will get the same symbol back. So, like you can always recreate a symbol after that you've lost it. And finally, after the records and tuples proposal, we would have records and tuples. Uh, if they contain a unique symbol, they would be garbage collectible. If they just contain uh, other forgeable values, they would be themselves forgeable because you can just take all their contents, stick them together, and recreate the same record or the same tuple. Currently, objects and functions are the only valid Wikmap keys or Wikset keys. Uh, with the symbols as Wikimap keys proposal, we are trying to also allow unique symbols to be used as Wikimap keys and Wikset keys. So why not also records and tuples containing unique symbols? Uh, the main reason is that the implementation for them would be really complex uh, because uh, it's not that you can collect records or tuples when they're not uh, reachable anymore, but you, you have to check that their contents are not reachable. So this is something that might be introduced in the future. Uh, we first wanted to see if it's really needed uh, or not after or like releasing records and tuples in the wild. So thanks to this proposal, we can now reference objects in records and tuples. Uh, instead of directly putting the object there, we can put a simple placeholder representing the object. And we can have a site table uh, built using weak maps uh, that maps from the symbol to the object and from the object to the corresponding symbol. It's important to use weak maps and not maps for this uh, because maps would leak a lot of memory. Uh, because every object that you add to this site table, uh, like if it was a map and not a weak map, it would be reachable forever. So the, the browser would never be able to garbage collect that and you would end up consuming too much memory and potentially crushing the browser process. In practice, we expect user land libraries to hide that sub table weak map based implementation detail. Uh, we expect libraries uh, to like be published on NPM or on CDNs providing an easier interface. This is just an example. We could have a box and an unbox function, uh, and they would take care of converting objects to symbol and symbols back to objects. Why do we need libraries for this? Why do not we just implement it in the language? Uh, we might implement it in the language in the future, but we first want to see what patterns emerge within the community, especially regarding, for example, how to handle uh, like cross-realm uh, accesses or how equality should be defined when there are objects referenced in records and tuples. Okay, so we have seen uh, what records and tuples are and how and why uh, we have those two related proposals. Can you already use records and tuples uh, today? Uh, well, yes, or at least partially. So, change array by copy. Uh, for change array by copy, we have already polyfills, uh, such as the shims and CoreJS, and it's at stage three in the standard in the standard process. Uh, stage three means that browsers are implementing it now. So, in the next month. Uh, they will probably release them in their main, like in their stable versions. Symbol uh, as Wikimap keys is not polyfillable, so you cannot use that proposal yet uh, unless it's implemented directly in browsers. You could use a map instead of a Wikimap, but again, be careful about memory leaks and only do that in like small scripts and not like real applications. And finally, you can use the records and tuples proposals thanks to Bubble by compiling them to all their syntax. So if, for example, you are already using Bubble, you can enable the proposal record and tuples uh, plugin, and it will, it will convert tuples or records using their custom syntax to calls to the tuple and record factories. 
uh, which are similar to how we have the string function for strings or the number constructor for numbers. Uh, and in theory, those record and tuple factories should be global. Uh, in practice, we have a semi-official polyfill uh, that makes it possible to already work with them. And if you want to test the change array by copy proposal, uh, you can load all the necessary polyfills, for example, from the ESShims project, uh, which is a project that provides NPM packages for every JavaScript function. Uh, and this should already work in the browser. They are quite small polyfills. And lastly, we have an online playground. So I know that clicking a link on my slides on projected here is not ideal, but if you Google for record and tuple playground, you will find it. Uh, I, I can probably show it. You can try using records and tuples uh, like directly in the browser as, as if it was a browser's console and see like how they behave. And <laughs> that's all. Uh, that's, I finished my talk. I wanted to, I shouldn't have clicked on the link because I wanted to show the last slide, which was the same as the first slide, uh, just with my contact information. If you had any other questions, I'm also happy to answer any question that you might have now. Uh, so thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Thank you, Nicolò. Um, is there any question? Yeah, lots of questions. So we'll start with Giuseppe, I suppose. Okay, thank you, Nicolo. Uh, you have mentioned before that uh, uh, the only um, object you can put inside the uh, record and tuples are actually other record and tuples. Uh, this uh, is uh, um, a syntax question, and I'm sure it's, uh, it has been discussed before. But since we are forced to use record and tuples inside record and tuples, why should um, why don't uh, why mm, the the proposal doesn't uh, doesn't assume that all the uh, objects inside them uh, should be considered as record and tuples as well? Okay, so like. This question is like, why do we have to repeat the hash every time and I cannot just exactly. use an object literal without repeating the hash? Uh, the reason is that uh, an important consideration when designing new JavaScript feature, features is that they should be easy to, to, ref, to be refactored. Uh, if we allow the hash to be optional and you decide to refactor your code, for example, taking this record out of, like taking this nested record uh, like syntactically out of the main record, uh, just by moving it to somewhere else, it would stop being a record and start becoming an object. So if you remove something from inside the record, assign it to a variable, and then put that variable inside the record, it would suddenly be an error. Uh, and well, the error is not that bad because you see what's happening. The problem is that when you do not have an error because you maybe are using it somewhere else, you expect it to be an immutable record and instead it is an object. Okay, thank you. Hi, again, thanks for the presentation. It's been quite nice. I've been a bit confused about the choice of uh, the equality operator. And uh, apparently, but just apparently, the lack of an identity operator. Uh, so by identity, you mean what's how object equality works. Uh, no, like what, what I mean is, uh, what I, the way I imagine this could be used is that you have something that is immutable and you keep it, you pass it to something else and you get another thing back which might or might, might not have been mutated. I mean, mutated means created yeah. a new version. And then what I would like to do is just do an identity check, like reference comparison, technically, so that I know if it's still the same or not. And in my opinion, this is something that would be quite useful, probably much more useful than deep uh, equality comparison. And intuitively, the triple equality should suggest something like identity equality, because it's like a primitive. While perhaps, I just say perhaps, uh, double equality would might suggest uh, uh, deep comparison. And, and again, I think the two are 
insanely useful, both of them. You should provide both. So I was just confused as why not. Okay, so, uh, well, if two things are have the same identity, uh, they would obviously be a record equal. So, uh, on the other hand, you might have two uh, recursively equal structures with have not the same identity, where identity here is not well defined, but it's this thing that we have. Uh, so the main reason is that you, we want to simplify how equality in record works using the triple equal operator, uh, because you have, you might have a function that takes a record, as you were saying, and it might or might not update it. Uh, however, it might also try to update it by replacing a property with a property with the same value. And uh, like, for example, you have a record x1 and y2, and that function takes any record and adds some y2 property. So this function would not really modify the record, but if we used uh, an identity definition similar to what we have for objects, uh, it would probably have a different identity. I'm saying probably because, again, identity is not like well defined in this case, other than maybe how the engine internally keeps track of things. Uh, we wanted to have a single operator so that engines are free to optimize it as much as possible. Like, if the identity of two things is the same, uh, the engine would immediately know that by just checking that the pointer is the same. And this is what already happens for strings. Uh, strings in practice are implemented as trees of substrings. And when you compare two strings, uh, it's a deeper quality comparison between these two trees. Uh, however, if you have a string and like pass it to a function that the function returns the, that exact same string back, uh, what the engine does is just an identity comparison between, the, between their pointers. So the, the idea was that records and tuples uh, would behave similar to this. Uh, and hide the, the detail of what is the entity of a record. Uh, because if two records are deeply equal, you don't really care if they're equal because they have the same identity or because they have the same contents. Because in the end, they will have the same effect on how your program behave, behaves. Yes, uh, it's not having in JIT compilers. Like, uh, I'm working on an experimental implementation in SpiderMonkey, Firefox Engine, and the equality, like the first check that we do when comparing two records is if they have the same pointer. Okay, we have a question from Hoping. Uh, yeah, uh, more than one, actually. So, uh, any roadmap about tuples and record TypeScript implementation? Uh, so, TypeScript. Okay, so when we have a proposal, we have to follow a process which is divided in four stages. And the third stage is when browsers should start implementing them. TypeScript follows the same, the same approach. So TypeScript will wait for records and tuples to reach stage three, uh, which means that the proposal is mostly finished and it's ready to be implemented in stable browsers. I hope to reach stage three maybe by the end of the year. Uh, but there are so many like variables that it's not it's more a hope than an expectation and then uh, can tapos records be converted to plain objects uh yes uh, well for example you could spread them in an object to get an object uh we do not have utilities to deeply convert them to objects uh because it's not common to have a deep immutable structure and wanting to have a parallel deep mutable structure. Uh, what you could do is, for example, to wrap it with a proxy uh, to allow mutations and create mutable objects like when things are mutated. Uh, or you could convert it to JSON and then parse it back or have your own like deep conversion utility. And um, thank you. Then Luca asks, uh, would, would object destructuring work with records? Uh, yes, and already destructuring works with tuples. Uh, this is similar to how, in reality, like object destructuring already works, for example, with strings. You can use, like, you can take the zero property from a string using object destructuring. Thank you. Is there any other question? Yeah, there was another, but I. 
can't see it now. Ah, sorry. <laughs> it's not working anymore. No worries. Okay. No worries. Oh, yeah. Here I am. Sorry. Um, how to convert an object to record using its var name. Var name raised syntax error. Maybe if you want to see the question okay. yourself. So. Okay. Uh, so this person is asking if we can, like, if we have a variable containing an object, uh, let's say an object variable, if we can put a Nash in front of that variable, uh, which matches the syntax of uh, of records and tuples to convert that variable to a record. Uh, again, we do not have deep com deep conversion utilities from objects to records, which is the other way around than the other question, uh, because that's like that may cause performance problems because you have to traverse the whole structure. So records should uh, you should choose if you want to record an object since the beginning. Uh, again, you could use, for example, a deep conversion function or stringify to JSON and parse it as a record. Uh, but uh, we do not have like deep conversion utilities. Uh, okay. I okay. 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 Thank you, Nicola. Thank you, Nicola. Thank you everyone. <laughs>